Could I have everyone's attention, please? I was at Greensburg this uh, past week. It seems like a long time ago, but it was this past weekend. And I told them the magic words, often in Anglican circles, is the Lord be with you, and that quiets everybody down. But in my world, if I, I say, don't make me whistle. Um, <laughs> and because when I whistle, it's very loud and extremely disturbing. So um, don't make me whistle. Uh, Welcome to everybody to the 157th Convention of the Anglican Diocese of Pittsburgh. It is great to be with you and uh, to be at my first convention as your bishop. Um, praise the Lord, it will not be the last. So, well, God willing and all that sort of thing, because um, that also matters. All right, let us pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, by your Holy Spirit, you presided in the council of the blessed apostles, and you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to be with your church to the end of the world. Be with the council of your church assembled here in your name and presence. Save us from all error, ignorance, prejudice, and pride, and of your great mercy direct, sanctify and govern us in our work by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit, that the order and discipline of your church may be maintained, and that the gospel of Christ may be truly preached, truly received, and truly followed in all places, breaking down the kingdom of sin, Satan, and death, till all your scattered sheep, being gathered into one fold, become partakers of everlasting life. Through the merits and death of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Before we call our convention to order, the first uh, item of business is to review our agenda um, and elect our, uh, our secretary convention. We'll then consider a resolution to admit a, fel a mission fellowship, review seat, seat voice and vote considerations before voting to approve the minutes of our two previous um, conventions. I will give my annual address, followed by an announcement of the district caucus results. Uh, we will hold our annual elections for committees and offices after which we will hear a report from our Chancellor, Delia. We will review and vote on the 2023 budget and finish any elections if required. Following the business meeting, we will take a few minutes to note clergy, congregations and and clergy and congregation transitions across the diocese and offer thanks to outgoing staff and committee members before we adjourn and offer closing prayers together. So that's the plan of us going forward. So I therefore, call this 157th Annual Convention of the Anglican Diocese Pittsburgh to order. Uh, I would like to call upon Ms. Stacy Regan, Acting Secretary, to certify a quorum. Bishop, clergy, and lay delegates to convention. According to Article 5, Section 1 of the Constitution, we have a quorum. Great, thank you so much. I would like to call upon the Reverend Jonathan Millard, President of Diocesan Council, to nominate a Secretary of Convention. I call uh, place into nomination as Secretary of this Convention, Ms. Stacey Regan. Uh, are there any other nominations? Everybody's See rushing to do that, I know. <laughs> um, hearing none, I will entertain a motion to elect Ms. Stacey Regan as Secretary of this Convention. Is there a second? Uh, Thank you, Doug. Um, are there any questions or discussion? All in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Opposed, nay. You, Ms. Reagan, are the Secretary of the Convention. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And I hereby appoint uh, Mr. Alan Calm to serve as our judge of elections. Thank you, Alan. So, uh, we have a resolution to admit a mission fellowship among us. St. Thomas Anglican Church in Fort Collins, Colorado has petitioned this convention for admission to the diocese as a mission fellowship. I invite Eric Rhodes, Reverend Eric Rhodes, on behalf of the Diocesan Council to propose a resolution to receive St. Thomas Anglican Church as a mission fellowship of the diocese. Thank you, Bishop. 
Whereas St. Thomas Anglican Church, Fort Collins, Colorado, has incorporated as a Colorado nonprofit corporation and now seeks to be received by the Anglican Diocese of Pittsburgh as a mission fellowship, and whereas this congregation has met the canonical requirements for acceptance into the diocese as a mission fellowship, now, therefore, be it resolved that this 157th Annual Diocesan Convention of the Anglican Diocese of Pittsburgh receive with joy St. Thomas Anglican Church, Fort Collins, Colorado, as a mission fellowship with full privileges and responsibilities and with seat and voice in this convention. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, Francis Metcalf. Any questions or discussion? So all in favor to adopt the resolution to receive St. Thomas Fort Collins, Colorado as a mission fellowship, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Carried. This resolution is adopted. We welcome St. Thomas Anglican Church Fort Collins as the newest mission fellowship of the Let me pray for them as they join us. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, you manifested your love by sending your only begotten Son into the world that all might live through him. Pour out on your church your spirit that we may fulfill his command to preach the gospel to all people. Send forth laborers into your harvest, defend them in all dangers and temptations, and hasten the time when the fullness of the Gentiles shall be gathered in and faithful Israel shall be saved. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We will now turn to seat, voice, and vote considerations. Are we having fun yet? <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. Um, uh, annual reporting delinquencies. I am delighted to announce that all of our congregations submitted their annual reports for the first time, apparently, in five years. So, <laughs> let's make that a habit. Um, audit delinquencies. The following congregations have not submitted a financial audit for 2021, Church of the Great Shepherd, Wheaton, and Church of Our Savior, Glenshaw. And pursuant to Canon 20, Section 5, in any case of failure to file such audits, memorandum, or summary as required herein, any and all lay deputies of such delinquent congregations shall be entitled to seats with voice, but no vote at convention. We also want to extend a warm welcome to the members of the Standing Committee, the Board of Trustees, Diocesan Council, and Committee on Canyons, Canons who are not clergy or certified lay deputies from the congregations Pursuant to Canon 3, Section 3, these members have privilege of the floor convention, but shall have no votes. Um, we also welcome Delia Biankin, is that correct? Biankin. Biankin, I'm so sorry. Our diocesan chancellor, whose name I've massacred right out of the gate. Um, um, pursuant to Article 3, Section 3, the chancellor shall be ex officio a member of the convention with the right to a single vote in the lay order. There are members of the diocesan staff who are present and not seated as deputies, Sarah Qualick, Stephanie Finn, and sadly not Christina Silva, who is homesick, please pray for her, um, and Jen Newhouse, um, who is not homesick, she's actually here. Um, thank you all for your help in managing the business of this meeting of the convention. A lot of work has gone into this um, that um, I couldn't even imagine, so here we are. So thank you all very much. And And finally, a welcome to all observers and guests and those who may be reviewing us through live stream. We are glad that you are with us. All right, the next thing we need to do is the approval of the minutes of the 156th Annual Convention and the Special Convention to elect a bishop. Um, we'll do those uh, separately. And the minutes of the 156th Annual Convention have been delivered in the pre-convention journal. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the 156th Annual Convention as presented? Uh, and that, is, uh, that was Glenn, Glenn right, sir. Uh, and is there a second? Jeff Wiley, Jeff Wiley seconding. Um, is there any are there any questions or discussion? 
All in favor of approving the minutes of the 156th Annual Convention as presented, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. All opposed, nay. The minutes of the 156th Convention are approved as presented. Also, the minutes of the 2022 Special Convention to elect a bishop have also been delivered in the pre-convention journal. Um, uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the 2022 Special Convention to elect a bishop as presented? Andrea Millard, is there a seconder? Uh, Herb Bailey at the back. Um, now, I am aware of several corrections needed for typos or consistency and need to shorten two entries um, with proper formatting for minutes and one correction on page 22 regarding lay testimonials in general. This, the, the piece on lay testimonials should read this. All lay deputies and all clerical deputies, excepting three who still concern, concurred regarding the validity of the election, signed the required form of testimonials clarifying, uh, certifying the election. Uh, that's just an articulation of what actually happened, not necessarily what, was, what we just, I think the original thing said all did, and in fact all but three. Um, but they were contacted and they concurred with the validity of the election. Are there any questions or discussion on that? Stacy, who seconded it? Uh, that was Herb Bailey. Okay, all in favor, say aye, raise your hand. Aye. Opposed? Minutes of the 2022 Special Convention are approved as amended. And now it's time for the Bishop's Address. I will move for this. This has already been perfect. Um, it'll make sense in a minute here. Hang on a second why I think it's perfect. If you would pray with me, please. Father, I thank you so much for your faithfulness to us, uh, your faithfulness to this world that you have created um, and uh, to our church. And we pray, Lord, that you would pour out your grace upon us even as we meet today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've now been your bishop just shy of three months. Um, as of tomorrow, it will be three months. And I still don't technically live in Pennsylvania. Um, but as of yesterday, I no longer have a house in Chicago, and that's a little bittersweet. And God willing, on Tuesday, when we close on a home in Wexford, we will have resolved the not technically in Pennsylvania part. Last weekend, I enjoyed, uh, many of us, in fact, enjoyed the privilege of sharing with Archbishop Emeritus Bob in the celebration of his 50th anniversary of presbyteral ministry. It was particularly delightful for me because for the first time I find, found myself genuinely excited to see people I recognized um, <laughs> and had conversations with. Um, it, it, really, it really was sweet. It was really sweet, and I was really delighted to see a lot of people there. And the warmth that I experienced in any number of conversations on that day um, are indicative of the general warmth with which you all have welcomed Tamara and me um, into this diocese, so thank you very much. I, we appreciate that tremendously. In my mind, and now in your experience for the foreseeable future, um, the bishop's address at convention is some combination of a state of the union and some sort of rallying cry, often called the bishop's charge. Um, I do want to give some State of the Union sort of reflections and um, some exhortations. Maybe a little shy of a rallying cry, um, but well, we'll see. But first things first. Uh, we read this in the 12th chapter of Revelation. Um, so perhaps last things first. But anyway, um, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of, of his Christ have come. For the accuser of, our, accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and that they love not their lives even unto death. In the years that I was planning a church in Vermont, we never owned a, billion, a building, or you, and we ended up using rented space. 
and often needing to do the setup and tear down that church plants know very well, which gets very wearing over time. However, when it came to the annual meeting, we never had to talk about roofs and buildings. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and what this did is it gave us an opportunity at our annual meeting to ask the question and share with each other, what is it that God has been doing among us in the past year, which frankly, in my opinion, is the point of the annual meeting. Um, it is to give testimony, because the word of our testimony matters in the overcoming of the accuser. Um, and so to meet together as a body without giving testimony is to fail to give the honor that is due to his holy name, because God has been active among us. So let's not fail to do that. Oh dear, somebody is thinking, he's about to do open mic. <laughs> I am not. Um, uh, we're not going to do that. Um, but we are going to do something. Um, I want to take five minutes, and I'm going to time this for you, and you're going to find a friend who is sitting next to you. Um, it might be an enemy, all the better. And so, um, uh, one, it's two people. I'm going to give you a minute of silence to think of an answer to this question, where have I seen Jesus active in my life, in my church, in my community, in whatever? Where have I seen Jesus doing cool stuff in my world in this past year? I'm going to give you a minute of silence. You're going to turn to the person next to you, and one person's going to have two minutes to, tell, to give testimony um, to what Jesus is doing, and the other person is going to have two minutes. So I'm going to give you um, about 30 seconds to find a, a person to have this conversation. So break up into pairs. Okay, that's, that's, that's enough cheerful chatting. Moving on. Don't make me whistle. No, seriously, don't make me whistle. All right, I'm going to give you, this is because I want you to give up, I want to give you some time to stop and think about the answer to the question. Because often when we are invited to give testimony, we end up thanking, you know, um, Louise, who was very kind and did a nice thing for me, which, is, which you should do. If Louise has been nice, you should do that. But this is giving testimony to the movement of God in the person of Jesus in the past year. So I'm going to give you a minute of silence to think about that, and then you may share. I will tell you when the minute of silence is up. I'm timing. Okay, first person, you have two minutes to give testimony.
Okay, you should be wrapping up person one now, and person two has, should be beginning around now. So person two, your two minutes starting now. All right, we're gonna, all right, let's wrap it up. Well, thank you all so much for um, indulging me. I. Um, so I want to move on to sort of my observations of perhaps the State of the Union. And the first thing I want to say is in reaction to what just happened. Um, I am joyous and relieved that you had something to say. Um, um, that's good news. Um, because it indicates, and it was not hard for you to find something to say. Praise the Lord. Because it is if there's a theme of my life, is that Jesus is active. He is moving among us, um, and we need to be paying attention. So thank you for paying attention, and thank you for giving witness to our Lord and praise. And I want to give praise to him. Father God, I thank you so much. I thank you that you continue to work in the life of your church. Lord, I thank you that you continue to lead us and to guide us, to bless us, to encourage us, to correct us transform us. And so, Lord, we continue to invite you um, that all the honor and the praise and the glory would be yours. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I, uh, uh, there are a, a million ways I could slice this up, um, but I'm going to start with um, a couple of things that I'm going to, what, what, what we are start, what I've been starting with very briefly. Then I'm going to, then I'm going to say um, as quickly as I can, uh, three things that I have seen, and then I'm going to pray. So, stuff that we're starting with. So, one of the things, uh, the two things that I, as I've become, begun my time here among you to start with, are, uh, number one, is my job right now is to get to know the diocese. Um, um, I do not yet know you. Um, I know some of you more, many more of you becoming familiar to me, but I do not know you yet. I've been involved, I've been doing parochial visits um, beginning to the end of, um, of September, and I'm, I think, booked out until Christmas, 
and then beyond that, and it, and it, and it keeps on going. I, and I'm really committed to that because that's the most one of the most important things that I can do, is to get to know congregations and to get no, to know clergy. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the things that I'm discovering in some of that that I've done to date, but, um, but uh, that's the first thing, and that's my first job, and I think it's really important to get to know and to understand who you are, and get, for you to get to know and understand who I am, um, because I pray that this will be a long and joyous relationship. The second thing is, with the, the diocesan staff, um, we're working currently on some administrative cleanup. Most of the clergy are aware of this, um, but we're going through files, making sure we have what we need to have, and, and when we don't have that, we are um, sending communications. Um, thank you for responding so quickly and um, graciously to uh, those requests. We are just trying to make sure that we have everything in order um, as we continue to go forward, and that's because it's important. It's just very important. So those are kind of big pieces of this, and there's one thing, I guess, also that comes back to actually getting to know you as well, is that I want to kind of articulate here is, um, beginning in the new year, I'm going to start to organize this a little bit, but I'm going to start to do um, regional clergy visits. Um, so like we used to do in sort of in districts, it may not technically be in districts, we've got to figure out what that is, but um, you can expect probably twice a year the bishop is going to be with your group um, um, and for probably something midweek, maybe in the evening, um, just to gather. And, I understand that, particularly you clergy, that you know your lives are full, and it's like, oh dear heavens, another meeting. Um, I, 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 I want to try to commit to you that I want to come to you to pour into you, not to bleed out of you, um, and that's why I want to be there. So that will be happening in the new year. Um, so that's a little bit about getting to know and the admin cleanup. Some things that I have been observing um, as in the time that I have been here. Um, I've seen some numbers, I've seen some hurt, and I've seen quite a bit of hope. Um, and let's do them in that order. The numbers. I'm kind of a numbers and a spreadsheet. I love spreadsheets. Um, people are often uh, surprised to discover that, but I really do. I find them incredibly interesting. And you can do a lot of things with a spreadsheet, you know? I mean, they're really powerful. Um, you have no idea. Um, so I love numbers and spreadsheets. So when I saw the pre-convention journal, I may or may not have quickly flipped to the end to look um, at congregational statistics. Now, if you have seen them, you'll notice that in the pre-convention journal, they're surrounded by provisos and qualifying statements about COVID, and you know you can't measure the people that are online, blah, 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 blah. But notwithstanding all of those provisos, the truth is there are quite a few small and possibly shrinking congregations among us. And that is anxiety producing for us and demoralizing for many. And I want to say something about this. Numbers matter. Numbers are data, but they are not destiny. Here. They are not destiny. It is true that if nothing changes, the prognosis for some may not be good. <laughs> but the Lord still has something to say, coming back to miraculous expectations, friends. You know, this, con this, this diocese, I would suggest, as I have observed it as well, has a, has a passion for mission, a long history of mission. A lot of congregations have partner congregations in other parts of the world. There have been mission organizations that have been rooted here, and there are some that, are sti that still are. There was a small mob of Pittsburghers at New Wineskins. Actually, a large mob, frankly. Um, but I want to say something. I love your passion for mission. Make it local. I don't want to take away overseas mission. But unless we take local mission seriously. I mean, there may be unreached people groups in other parts of the world. There are some down your street, too. There really are, and down my street. And I don't have, at this point, a five-step plan of how we get into local mission. Um, um, but we're going to be praying about that. But I'll tell you what I am doing right out of the gate. 
In my daily prayers, after I and say the collect for mission, I pray for conversions to Christ and growth in local mission. Would you join me in daily praying for conversions to Christ and the growth of local mission? Um, missionary grace, babies. It's really important. And how does this happen? How did the local mission happen? Well, fundamentally, there are two ways in which local mission happens. Either we plant a new church or we renew and revitalize um, an existing congregation. Um, now, I'm just going to give a little plug for my dear friend Mark Eldridge that's coming to Trinity School for Ministry in January to do a workshop on renewal and revitalization. And if you feel that you're small and struggling, or even if you're not small and struggling, you might be huge and um, thriving, but want to understand revitalization, I invite you to bring not just one person, but a contingent to that event. I think it's important that we begin to think seriously about renewal and revitalization. And so that's going to be happening in January. Mark will be here. I really want to, and there'll be more information on that. I'll have it at the back. Or I've got some flyers on that, and you can call Trinity. They know about it as well. But for those of you who are in a place where you want renewal and revitalization, I want you to have the right expectations. Because those are great words, aren't they? Renewal, revitalization, love that. And you will until it happens. Because it will mean change for you. It will mean change for you. And if you're like me, you don't love change. Um, it's going to hurt. Um, in that process, you will lose something that you love. I had a great conversation when I was a, a student at seminary um, from, with a, an elder parishioner that had, in my placement, and I went to see her, and it was a congregation that had been renewed and revitalized and had used to be just a, sort of this shrinking older congregation, and then all these young families started pouring in. And I had this wonderful meeting with this woman. And she... Um, she was like 80 at the time, so I'm sure she's gone on to her greater reward. Um, um, but she said to me this wonderful thing. She said, I hate the noise of children. <laughs> but she said, I hate the silence of them being not there more. <laughs> Babies, it is going to hurt. It is going to hurt. But if we are to be so serious, things will have to change, and it will be uncomfortable, and there are some things we're not going to like. So this is it. This is you getting over it. That's how it is. <laughs> See, if you're humorous, you can say rough things, and people think it's charming. <laughs> but I actually do mean that, so just, be, just, so, just so you're clear. The second thing I want to say is, is I, I, I've heard, of, I, I've looked at the numbers and I've heard about numbers, and I've also heard about the hurt. I mentioned this in, before in the search process of things that I've observed and what I read. Many in our, con in our congregations, in our dioceses, are still recovering from the realignment, which I've said before is a small word um, to describe the very difficult and painful period in the life of this diocese. Broken relationships, lawsuits, and negotiations. Um, and ultimately around properties and losses for people that were some people that were very personal. And that's a real hurt. But in this moment, um, we, want, we need to be able to articulate that hurt. But at some point, we do need to move on. It has hurt. It has been painful. But it has been a while. Um, and at the heart of this, there will be people that have hurt us. Um, there will be people that we have hurt in the process. Um, and honestly, the only wisdom I know about this is from the gospel. Um, Lord, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. We need, it's, I know it's painful, but we need to let go. We need to let go. You know, and there's been turmoil also in the transition from Bishop Jim through the interim with Bishop Martin and now to a new bishop being me. And much of that feels unresolved for many. And I've had a range of conversations with people about what happened around Bishop Jim and, you know, you know why that was so terribly unfair and why didn't more happen. And, and there's, just, um, there's, there's a range of feelings about that. There were also painful decisions made on staffing 
in the diocese, in the diocese too. It was hard. It was a lot of ouch. And again, we need to talk about these things. We need to be able to have these conversations with each other. I was sad. I was hurt. I thought it unfair when. Those are the conversations we need to have. The conversations we don't need to have are, you did this, you did that, and you did the other thing. I was sad. I was hurt. I thought it unfair. We need to recognize that there was a lot of hurt um, for everyone. And so we need to be able to talk on it. But I want to make a, a, a distinction to be able to talk about it and bring it forward. And the emotional equivalent of sucking on a Werther's original. Um, you know what I mean. This hurt. I'm going to roll it over on my tongue a little longer. Mm, I'm going to feel the hurt afresh. Mm, I feel angry again. Mm -hmm. this, and we find some, something in that. Please don't. Please don't. Um, um, because just like the just like numbers are not, are not our destiny, not our destiny, neither is hurt. Jesus died for your sins, and He died for theirs too. Not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And all of this needs to be offered to Jesus to be taken to um, His cross, into His wounds, that we might be healed. So, there we are. Two things: the numbers and the hurt, and now the hope. Now, the last two sections might feel a little depressing to you. Oh, oh this is not very happy. Um, but despite the fact that there, you know, you know, there are some, challenge, I mean, some challenges, that's my euphemism for there's a lot to get done here. Um, and there has been hurt, and the numbers don't look great. There's some fear in all that. But boy, people have been hopeful. There is an anticipation of the goodness and the grace of God that I have seen. There are good and exciting things happening in many congregations. There are good and exciting things happening in other institutions. I think of Trinity School for Ministry. They've had a transition in leadership just as we are. What an opportunity um, for us to partner in developing local mission in our diocese. There are just opportunities in front of us. There are good and exciting things in in many congregations, in many people's lives, because God is always at work through Jesus in the power of the Spirit. And there continue to be people coming to faith in our diocese and in our communities. Really, there are. Um, I hope some people have been telling those stories. Somebody told me a story about that just last week, about a family that had come to faith. Praise the Lord. It's still happening. And there continue to be men and women seeking discernment for ordination, because the call of God remains on his church. And there are congregations that are making plans for growth. Not for circling the wagons, but for growth. I would suggest to you that hope is always a reasonable response for a Christian. Because hope is rooted in the sure promise of if you leave it up to us, we will get it wrong. But it's not up to us. We have a part to play. We need to respond in obedience as he calls us, as I said earlier. But it's rooted in the sure promise of God. It's his, un -enduring and his enduring and unending faithfulness um, in the saving work of Jesus for all the promises of God in him are yes and Amen. So I've seen hope. There's been hope here. People have spoken hopefully and excitedly about the future. Praise the Lord. Um, but I want to remind you also, my dear brothers and sisters, that hope is not a feeling. It is a habit. It is a virtue. And a virtue is basically an action, a good action, that is practiced. There is a choice to hope. And there's a choice to despair. Hope, if I want to put in the, these languages, is miraculous expectation practiced. And I want to invite you to hope um, because the Lord is king. 
and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured within, out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given us. And that is the end of my address. God bless you all. And now as I return to my chair, I'm going to invite um, Alan Kahn to come and, um, and read the report on the district elections uh, held prior to the caucuses. Sarah has been uh, kind enough to give all of us a script. <laughs> which is the reason things are moving so well at the moment. <clears throat> but I'd like to go off script for just one second. <laughs> Those who know me from Church of the Ascension know this is not unusual. <laughs> But uh, over the past year, uh, serving on the Board of Trustees, there is one specific reason why things have been carried on. And she is sitting right up here. Thank you, Sarah. How many of you know the second verse to that? Here it comes. Happy birthday to you, to Jesus be true. May God's richest blessings rest always on you. Thank you. And now back to the script. I am pleased to announce the results of the district caucuses as follows. District 1, Council Lay Member, Mrs. Mary Ann, this is where I have to apologize as the bishop has for any mispronunciations, Miss Mary Ann Manis, Dersky, clergy member, the Reverend Glenn Christer, Christer, excuse me, who is elected for, to a second term. District chair, the Reverend Francis Metcalf. District vice chair, the Reverend Michael Husted. District two, excuse me, what was that? Husted, okay. District 2, Board of Trustees, Mrs. Rose McDonough. I got that right because I had an aunt named McDonough. <laughs> Council, lay member, Mr. Richard Martin. District Chair, the Reverend Eric Phillips. District Vice Chair, the Reverend Deacon Mary Beth Carey. District 3, Council, lay member, Mr. Tom Miller, elected to a second term. District Chair, the Reverend John Bailey. District Vice Chair, the Reverend Alex Shuttleworth. District Four Council Clergy Member, the Reverend Doug Blakelock. District Chair, the Reverend Jeffrey Wiley. District Vice Chair, the Reverend Brian Gerald. Now feel free to chime in uh, at any time. <clears throat> District 6, 
Council, lay member, Dr. Leslie Thyberg. District chair, Dr. Leslie Thyberg. District vice chair, Ms. Sarah Bradford. District eight, council lay member, Mr. Lawrence Silverstein. District chair, the Reverend David Grissom. District vice chair, the Reverend Deacon Carolyn Nunnally. District nine, board of trustees, Mr. David Greening. Council, clergy member, the Reverend Michael McGee. District chair, the Reverend Deacon Jocelyn Goodwin. District vice chair, Mrs. Ann McCarthy. District 10, district chair, the Reverend Regis Tarosi, thank you. District vice chair, the Reverend Deacon Nancy Kane McComb. Thank you very much. I call upon now the Reverend Jonathan Millard, President of Diocesan Council and a member of the nominating committee to begin our election process. Um, thank you for your service um, this year, Jonathan, with us. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Bishop Alec, uh, clergy, lay delegates of convention, uh, on behalf of the nominations committee, the slate of can candidates has been presented to you in the pre-conventional journal published on October the 6th. Uh, additional nominations have not been made in advance of this meeting, and the nomination period is now closed. So we will proceed to vote um, by committee? What is, what is it? Oh, I see. All right. All right. So um, um, in all cases, voting for lay candidates first and clergy candidates next. Um, for all votes with more than one nominee per open position, we have supplied paper ballots um, by clergy and lay order. Um, so, beginning. On the standing committee, we will elect one lay member and one clergy member. Um, on the ballot provided, please select one of the two lay nomine nominees for standing committee, Mrs. Mara Bateson or Mr. Jeff Forster. And uh, if, you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you'll find them in these. Um, um, if you're clergy, it's yellow. If you're lay, it's a different color. It's, it's green if you're, if you're lay. All right. Um, on the same ballot, the, please select one of the four clergy nominees for standing committee. The Reverend John Bailey, the Reverend Clint Curley, the Reverend Canon Tracy Russell, or the Reverend Deacon John Mark Smith. The tellers will collect your ballots, um, and please pass them to the aisles for collection. Um, and we'll continue our election while the tellers tally the votes for the standing committee nominees. So are all the ballots collected? It looks that way. All right. Great. So moving on um, to 
the Board of Trustees, lay. Um, we will like one lay member. We have one lay nomination nominee for the Board of Trustees, Mrs. Diane Sykes Bookhammer. This is a vote of affirmation. Um, all in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. All opposed, nay, and raise your hand. Mrs. Diane Sykes Bookhammer has been elected as a member of the Board of Trustees. Uh, why not? Yes. Uh, for the array, um, we will elect one lay member and three clergy members. Uh, we have one lay nominee for the array, Mr. Um, is it Rhea Red? Ray Red, Mr. Ray Red. Um, this is a vote of affirmation. All in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. All opposed, say nay, raise your hand. Uh, Mr. Ray Red has been elected as a lay member of the array. We have. <laughs> We have three clergy nominees for the array, um, the Reverend Dr. Keith Allman, the Reverend Joshua Bennett, and the Reverend Michael Husted. This is a vote of affirmation. Uh, all those in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Opposed, nay, and raise your hand. The Reverend Dr. Keith Allman, the Reverend Joshua Bennett, and the Reverend Michael Husted have been elected as clergy members of the array. We will elect one lay member and one clergy member of the Committee on Canons. Um, we have one lay nominee for the Committee on Canons, Mr. J. Roddy. This again is a vote of affirmation. All in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Opposed? Mr. J. Roddy has been elected as a lay member of the Committee on Canons. We have one clergy nominee for the Committee on Canons, the Reverend Deacon Mary Baker. This is a vote of affirmation. Um, all in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Opposed? The Reverend Deacon Mary Baker has been elected as a clergy member of the Committee on Canons. Thank you all very much for serving the diocese in this way. One of the things, one of the, the realities of our larger life together is that from time to time we are called upon to um, give our time and effort to um, the, larger, the larger work of the church and the diocese, and sometimes beyond the diocese. And uh, that is a great privilege, I think, and I, I appreciate the time that people have given and will continue to give to that. I want to call on um, Delia Bowers Biankin. I get it right this time, um, uh, uh, to give her report. So good afternoon. Um, I was going to re-pronounce my name, but I don't need to because <laughs> Bishop Alex did it beautifully. Um, so since January 1st, I have been your chancellor, and it has been a baptism by fire. Well, I was going to make a joke about that, but let's just say I jumped in with both feet, and it's been really busy. Um, I have learned a lot, and there's still a lot more to learn, um, but it has been beautiful to see how I feel like God has gotten me ready for this time and this place for this job, um, and just so you guys don't know, some of you know more about me. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces. But for the rest of you, when I thought about, which by the way, when I thought about what do I do for this report, I'm happy to say there isn't litigation to report on, so we can be thankful for that, right? <clears throat> and I don't have a huge time slot, and I thought about just talking about my kids, which they said they would, that wouldn't be appropriate, but... Uh, I will say that it was a blessing to have Jonathan Millard baptism, baptize my daughter and Tara Jernigan baptize my son um, and was married at Ascension and, you know, haven't been married 20 years. Okay, wait, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Um, I grew up in the boonies in Beaver County in a Christian home, wonderful Christian family. My parents were immigrants from the Netherlands, grew up on a farm. Milk goats every morning. I always think goats get the raw end of the deal in the Bible. That's also a talk for another day. But um, I went to Calvin College and then moved back to Pittsburgh for law school. 
I've been practicing law for 25 years. I did my first 10 years um, starting my practice at Kirkpatrick and Lockhart, now K&L Gates, and then um, Eckert Siemens, so 10 years of complex commercial litigation. Um, and then was blessed to find this opportunity to move up to Butler and join a company as their in-house um, general counsel, and I did that for 10 years. And now the last handful of years is my favorite season of my career, and I'm working with a boutique firm outside general counsel, which, by the way, fits really nicely with the work um, for, as chancellor for the diocese. Um, Lifelong learning, I mentioned before, I'm learning a lot. There's still a lot more to learn. I'm taking a canon class, and I have to say, there was one part I really liked, and I was like, I am gonna use this. Um, principle four, 17, you may know it, on administration, highlights that efficient administration prepares the ground for effective ministry. There's also this other great line where it talks about it's important to put in practices that are lawful, competent, and, you know, you don't see this in corporate bylaws very often, courteous. I really liked it. So, so it has been a tr true blessing to work with um, Bishop Martin Menz um, during the beginning of this baptism by fire. Um, and I can't say enough about the grace of Elaine Storm, um, chair of the standing committee, um, but also, I feel like I want to mention that it's been a blessing to learn from and be encouraged by Bishop Hicks, who is my pastor at St. Peter's and Butler. Um, and I am really enjoying this beginning this working relationship with our new bishop, Bishop Alex Cameron. Um, and it is the beginning of what I hope will be a long and blessed working relationship. I will tell you, we have a very ambitious list of projects ahead of us, um, including some property issues, but we're going to get those wrapped up. Or wait, should I promise that? I've got to be careful. Um, certainly, I've been pulled in already on some controversies, but again, with the message and the leadership from Bishop Alex, I am confident of our way forward. And if you allow me to just end with one of my favorite verses, Micah 6, 8, which has governed my practice and my life in a lot of ways. He has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, sure. We... Uh, People are still counting um, the results, so I'm going to get Sarah Qualick to begin with our financial uh, report, and she may pause partway through uh, to get a report on um, results. So, Sarah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys for singing to me. <laughs> um, it's milestone it, birthday. It is so, a milestone, um, and I'm not embarrassed about it at all. <laughs> I yeah. always say my husband is older than me, so I'm young. <laughs> I'm not 40, I'm 50. <laughs> I think my daughter said it really well. She said, Mom, you look so young for your age. You only look like you're 47. <laughs> so you can see I'm really aging well. I can't... This is always tricky when I do this up front, because in order to see you guys, I need my glasses on. But in order to see my script and actually say what I need to say, I need my glasses off. So I'll probably be like back and forth. But I want to start, um, like Alan, I want to start off script, because as we were sharing our testimonies, it occurred to me that um, one of my testimonies is directly related to this diocese. Uh, this, the beginning of this year, I was really in kind of a dark place. Some of you had conversations with me and knew. Like, I just, I felt overwhelmed. Um, I was losing our last staff member other than me, and I didn't really have any good prospects for who was going to fill all these voids in our staff, and we knew that we needed to rebuild the staff. And I felt overwhelmed and exhausted, and I, I didn't have the hope that I needed. Um, apparently, that wasn't my habit at that moment. <laughs> I, I wish I could say it was, but sometimes my holiness lapses a little. So I was, I was in a pretty dark place, and I was praying a lot, and that, that was good. But the testimony is that God 
showed up in phenomenal ways. And we had done a lot of due diligence. We had wonderful volunteers helping me to um, put together a plan for who we needed to hire, job descriptions, and where to go and look for these people. We had candidates, and even though those candidates weren't great, you know, we were like, okay, well, we have a plan. And then really out of nowhere, somewhere, the Lord provided just the exact right people for our staff. And we'll announce those staff people later, but I want to just share the, the testimony of God's faithfulness for bringing the right people together to support our new bishop. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that, and I want to start my report by giving thanks for, for that provision and also for the many volunteers and leaders in this diocese who, I, truly, I would not be standing here today. I would have quit a long time ago <laughs> if I hadn't been able to call so many of you and say, I need help. I need your wisdom. I need you to come in and do this thing for me. I need you to be on this committee. And I really can't think of very many people who said no. I had a few people say, could, can I do it next month? Yes, maybe that would work. Um, but really, I can't think of anybody who's just said no to me. And you guys have been incredibly faithful to this diocese. So thank you. With that said, um, I do want to call out one specific committee. So the finance committee we formed last year, and we continued it this year, and this has been such a help to me in this administrative role. Um, they continue to meet monthly in an advisory capacity. This is a committee that we put together with representation from our governing bodies. So Tom Hay represents the Board of Trustees. The Reverend Keith Almond and the Reverend Doug Blakelock represent diocesan council. And Wick Stevens represents the standing committee. Diane Edelstein was one of our founding members. Um, she was a former trustee for the diocese, and she served until August of this year. I just want to give a shout out to her. She's given phenomenal amounts of time and love to me and this diocese in the last two years. But she and her husband, David, moved to Virginia in August, and so she stepped off since she's not going to be in this diocese anymore, but um, she will certainly be missed. So there were several key recommendations that came through the Finance Committee this year. The first one I'm very happy to share with you. Um, we recommended that we pay off all the remaining debt that we owed in this diocese um, in March of this year so that when the bishop candidates came for their walkabouts, I was able to say to all of them, hey, if you're elected to be bishop of this diocese, we are debt free. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, So that was a, a tremendous effort to do that as quickly as we did. And again, I'm very thankful to so many people for helping that to happen. The next thing the committee recommended was that diocesan council make a resolution to create an emergency fund from surplus operating funds. This would then protect the diocese from incurring debt in the future. And we've done that. We've actually funded it with $200,000. You'll see in a few minutes. Um, and that's a wonderful provision for the future. Then we recommended that diocesan council retain unused funds from the legal budget. We, we put a fair amount in our legal budget um, this year, and we have again for next year. So we, um, we recommended that they retain those unused funds at the end of this year in a savings account so that if we have future legal action and we need more than what we've put in the budget, we have a little padding for that as well. The committee attended the 2021 annual audit review, and we were very pleased to receive a clean audit this year. So that's the finance committee. We want to move on and talk about where we are, where, what is our current financial position. So I've got this simplified balance sheet up here for you um, so that you can see what we have um, at our disposal. This is the numbers up here are as of September 30th. So obviously these numbers change every day as we pay bills and have income, but this is where we were at September 30th. So we had a total, our total financial assets, this is our cash and investment accounts, were $810,632. This does include three funds that are restricted, the legacy fund, the growth fund, I'll talk about both of those in a few minutes, and then other restricted funds, and that lumped other restrictions includes the Bishop's Discretionary Fund, a Deacon Formation Fund, a Youth Ministry Fund, and a Youth Scholarship Fund. So that leaves us with $371,386 in unrestricted financial assets. As I just mentioned, Diocesan Council agreed to set some um, designated funds aside for future use. So when you 
consider those being taken out and also our liabil other liabilities, we're left with $123,486 in available funds as September 30th. If you're accounting oriented and you're looking at this and saying, I want to know more, uh, there is a more detailed condensed balance sheet in the amended version of the pre-convention journal, which you can find online. All right, let's move on and talk about some of these restricted funds. So I've put the objectives for our legacy and growth fund up on the screen. I'm not gonna read these to you. I think all of you can read them. They're actually in the pre-convention journal as well. I want these to be available to you so you can see there is some overlap in what our objectives are for each of these funds. But ultimately, these funds are both in place to provide support for growth, for support for our churches, emergencies, um, provision for, for new church plants. There, there is overlap. The great thing that we have in the legacy fund is that it extends some of what we can do in the growth fund to clergy, not just congregations. So we have the opportunity to help clergy to pursue leadership development, sabbaticals, and that sort of thing. I think one of the best ways to help you to bring these objectives to life is to share three instances where we gave grants this year. So in 2021 and 2022, Jonah's Call requested grants from the diocese to help subsidize a two-year initiative to deepen their missionary presence in the east end of Pittsburgh. The Board of Trustees granted their request from the Legacy Fund. Jonah's Call hired a missionary artist intern so that they could offer ministry directly to artists who share their space at the Union Project and offer arts-based outreach to the East End community at large. This intern took on additional administrative responsibilities in the second year to promote longer-term sustainability for her role. She helps organize and lead outreach opportunities for the whole congregation in addition to her own ministry work. And the grants given to Jonah's Call have allowed them to establish deeper roots in the East End and to maintain <clears throat> excuse me, a weekday ministry of presence in a building they do not own. Their congregation has been encouraged as this strategy has already borne fruit. Another example, quite different from the first, Trinity Washington had already put considerable resources of their own into resurfacing their lower parking lot this year, but they needed to replace the parking lot lighting to complete the project. They came to the diocese for assistance and the board was happy to fulfill their request from the growth fund. On the surface, it may appear to be routine maintenance, but this project has allowed Trinity to keep their doors open to the community. Two years ago, they began to more intentionally invite others to share their space, and today their building is in use six days a week by anonymous groups, scout troops, a drum circle from the city mission, a clothing ministry, and a satellite food bank, not to mention occasional diocesan events and frequent church events. Ensuring a safe entry into the building is important to hosting so many people in their space and creating opportunities to share the gospel with the community around them. And finally, one of our more recent grant requests came from Christ the Redeemer in Cannonsburg. They're growing. Isn't that exciting when we have growing churches? They have 41 children under 15. And they needed to hire a part-time youth and children's director. Go figure. <laughs> uh, to encourage discipleship amongst the youngest of their congregation. However, they had already spent significant funds on infrastructure repairs this year, making it difficult to fully fund this new position. They approached the diocese to help cover 20% of the, the total cost of this new hire over three years, and the board heartily agreed to a grant from the growth fund. The board recognized Redeemer's own investment and the reality that these young people could not wait much longer to have this vital ministry partner um, hired to disciple them. I hold these three distinct examples of how the board is assisting our congregations with the focus on congregational health and growth is encouraging to all of you. The board can't fund all the grant requests it receives if we don't begin to replenish the restricted funds they have access to use. The growth fund currently depends upon gifts from our congregations and our offering today. We were happy to put towards that. There's no requirement to give from our churches. We don't tell our churches they have to give, but we do encourage our churches every year to consider giving up to 1% of their operating income to this fund. In 2021, we received gifts from 19 churches totaling $14,600. This year, we had 19 pledges totaling $21,650, so about 150% increase, so that's wonderful to begin with. 
Um, and year to date, we have granted 23,200 from that same fund that I just said we have pledges of 21,000 coming in for. So, um, <laughs> so you can see the current giving level is not a pace with the grants that we're, that we're giving, making from the fund. I do want to encourage our churches to consider a gift to this fund. If you're not already giving, I, I'm so grateful for those of you who give consistently year after year. But if you're not giving, consider this is your opportunity to give to your fellow churches when they have a need. Or at times, it's the opportunity that you have when you have a need to come to the diocese and ask for help. We want, to have the op we want to have the assets in this fund to be able to give whenever we're asked for, for a good request, right? We, we don't want to have to turn people down. But if we don't replenish this fund at a greater pace than we are right now, eventually we'll run out of money. So I just want to encourage you guys to think of it um, for what it really is. This is our way of being able to give to our churches when they have a need, especially when we have opportunities to help our churches grow and flourish in their communities. The Legacy Fund, I want to speak to just a little bit differently because the money for the Legacy Fund generally comes from individual donations. And since we, we opened up the campaign to start the Legacy Fund, um, as Archbishop Bob was, was retiring, we have not really done anything to replenish that fund since. We've had a few. We just took an offering last week um, at Archbishop Bob's uh, 50th ordination anniversary. Um, and so we put $2,000 back into the fund from that. Um, and we've had a few people give each year to it. But we really haven't had any significant gifts given since the campaign closed. So I do want to ask as individuals that we consider other, this is another way to support our churches. I never want people to give to this if it means not giving to their church. We want people to give to their local churches first. But if you have extra, this is a great way to support the cause of the gospel and to be able to, um, to benefit our churches at, on the whole. It is taking kind of a long time to count these ballots. <laughs> so I'm going to keep going. We're going to do the budget. Um, so we're going to look at the operating budget first. This is found on page 26 of your pre-convention journal. If you are following along, um, I'll show a little bit on the screen as well for you. So just know that the format that we give you in the pre-convention journal is the format for public consumption. It's also what you're going to see here today. This is a summary budget. Um, it's appropriate for everyone to view online. The Finance Committee and the Diocesan Council have carefully reviewed a far more detailed budget. And if any clergy member or lay deputy wants to see those details, all you have to do is ask, and I'll be happy to review it with you offline. So key budget items this year. We're going to look at income first. Um, it's important that you know that Godly Share is on track. Our giving from our churches um, is about 8% ahead of our forecast. We typically forecast conservatively, so this is good that we're ahead of our forecast, as of September 30th. And I do want to thank all of our congregations who are giving faithfully um, throughout this year. For 2023, we based our calculation um, that you see here on a combination of the actuals that we received in 2021 and the 2022 pledges that we had from our churches to try to make them as accurate as possible. Uh, we reduced this combination by 5%. Like I said, we like to forecast conservatively, and that's where we came up with this number of $877,382 for our godly share income. This is roughly a 5% increase over 2022. These calculations, as approved by Diocesan Council, are reported again in the journal. Next year in July, we're going to be asking our churches to help us to make this estimate. We did this last year. We just didn't have time this year, but we want to get into the habit of having our churches give us input before we make our budget rather than after. We think that's going to be a better practice to get more accurate forecasting in the future. Um, you'll also see on our income slide that there, the other contributions have been significantly lowered. Um, this is for, really for two reasons. One, Giving has been down in the last several years, individual gifts to the diocese, but also a lot of the gifts that we have gotten have been given to restricted funds, and those don't show up here. So we've lowered this to make it more in line with what we've actually been receiving. Um, that's why that is significantly different. All right, let's turn now to expenses. 
Uh, there's not a lot to say about the expenses. They're fairly similar to this past year with a few notable exceptions. We have increased our province expenses uh, because GAFCON takes place in April of 2023, and assembly, our provincial assembly, where we send a larger contingent of delegates takes place in June of 2024. So we just wanna make sure that we're budgeting enough to cover the expenses of this year and what's coming. Staff expenses have increased somewhat to cover new hires that are made, were made in 2022. So it's not significantly different, but it's a little bit. And then we wanna point out the contingency line. And this is important uh, because to have a balanced budget, we put this in, this is, if we took this out, we'd have a surplus budget, but we put this in as a contingency line, knowing that our new bishop needs um, a budget line that will help him cover any new hires he wants to make. That's really the bulk of what this is intended for. And then we also recognize that our current office lease ends in November of next year. And we do have an option to extend that for five more years. Um, but if we were to make the decision to move, there's money in the contingency line to cover such a move. So let's look at the final slide. On behalf of Diocesan Council, I am pleased to present a balanced 2023 budget to the convention. All right, uh, this 2023 operating budget is presented to the convention by Diocesan Council. I call on Jonathan Millard to make a motion to approve that budget. I move that. I move that we approve the 2023 operating budget as presented. It technically doesn't need to be seconded, as it turns out, but are there any questions or discussion? Wow, really? <laughs> All right, well, praise the Lord. Um, so, uh, if that, there being no questions or discussion, um, all in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Um, all opposed, say nay and raise your hand. The 2023 operating budget, um, um, as presented, is approved. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, what I think we might do as we're waiting for our counters um, is... Uh, Maybe we'll just take a little five-minute break, um, and because it's we've been at it for a bit, it's five after twelve. So, I'm sure we'll still have you out of here by one o'clock, as we have committed. Um, but let's just take a five-minute break. Apparently, don't well, don't don't dash off. Well, if you really need to, please do. But let, we'll take the five-minute break. Five-minute break. We're going to do it. Yep.
All right, can I, can I call us back to order, please? Actually, I'm not going to ask to call you back to order. I'm just going to call you back to order. We need a speaker of the house. Order. Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. A little gavel. A little gavel. Sure. Sure. All right. So we've got the budget done. That's fine. So presumably you have results in the lab. Well, hang on a second.
All right. Order, order in the house. All right, so I want to call on, on Alan to bring the results from our first ballot. It's good that all of you could get back here. Here are the results of the Standing Committee lay ballot. Mrs. Mara Bateson received 57.8% of the vote and has been elected as a lay member of the Standing Committee. Here are the results of the Standing Committee clergy ballot. The Reverend Clint Curley received 33.8% of the vote. The Reverend John Bailey received 32.5% of the vote. The Reverend Canon Tracy Russell received 24.8% of the vote. And the Reverend Deacon John Mark Smith received 8.9% of the vote. Uh, a runoff is required to elect a clergy member of the Standing Committee, so please take out your second ballot, which I think is pink for clergy and green for lay. Um, and if you would cross off John Mark Smith, John Mark Smith's name, um, and then uh, indicate by an X or a check or circling uh, the person you are voting for now. All right, if you have a ballot to be collected, please put up your hand so the tellers can get it from you. All right, so we shall move. Are all the ballots collected? All right, perfect. All right, so it's important. Uh, always to take time each year to acknowledge transitions among our clergy congregations and diocesan staff since um, the last uh, convention. Um, so I want to start uh, with some clergy transitions. Um, uh, there are, well, here we'll begin here. So the Reverend Deacon Jennifer Kang and the Reverend Dr. Len Finn were received into the diocese. Um, I'm not sure where um, the Reverend Deacon Jennifer Kang came from, but She's at Great Shepherd in Wheaton, but I don't know where she came from, I'm sorry to say. Um, but because I'm Canadian and have talked to him, um, I know that uh, Len Finn came from um, Canada. Um, not sure what that was, but it was enthusiastic, so I'm all on board. Um, <laughs> the Reverend Ron Bailey retired from St. Thomas's Church in Gibsonia, and if you saw the, uh, uh, the slideshow at the beginning, there were some pictures of that. Uh, the Reverend Deacon Nancy Lewis and the Reverend Dr. Langdon Pegram uh, were issued letters dimissory out of the Anglican Diocese of Pittsburgh. Uh, and so those are some clergy transitions. And we remember also the Reverend Deacon Dennis Wilson, who died in December last year, um, and whose memorial service I had the pleasure of attending uh, in, I believe, September of this year. And let us just um, pray Wake and give up. thanks. We remember...
navigate their grief. Amen. Um, the following clergy um, are serving in interim or new roles. The Reverend Kenny Benz, who has been the interim rector at Church of the Redeemer in Nashville, Tennessee, um, and has been, I've had some conversations with him, and Kenny's been doing a great job. And Greg Miller um, has been the interim rector at St. Thomas Gibsonia after the uh, retirement uh, of uh, uh, Ron Bailey. And so uh, those have been some interim uh, transitions within our diocese. And we celebrate the institution of the Reverend Dr. Len Finn as rector of All Saints Anglican Church in Cranberry uh, Township, Pennsylvania. Um, we should probably sort of acknowledge this. I, I do want to say just a word, particularly for those who are, have, have done and are con con currently serving in sort of interim roles. Interim roles between rectors are so important and helpful in congregations. And it takes a certain kind of person and a certain kind of gift to do that well. And, uh, and I'm really grateful for the people that offer their time and uh, their service in that way and serving churches who are in transition. Because when you're in transition, it's always anxiety producing for everybody. And so it's often very hard work. Um, a little more on clergy transitions. Um, this year, the following people were made deacons by the Right Reverend Martin Minns. The Reverend Deacon Kathy Haynes, the Reverend Deacon Jess Bennett, the Reverend Deacon Josh Bennett, and the Reverend Deacon Greg Sparks. And also this year, the following deacons were made priests by the Reverend, the Right Reverend Martin Minns, um, the Reverend Michael Husted, the Reverend Rob Lewis, and the Reverend Herb Bailey. So congratulations to those who. Another transition, which is um, not as happy, um, we do mark this year the closing um, of uh, Karis 24-7 at the end of 2021. I had um, a, a real privilege of a, of a coffee uh, meeting with uh, Sam Gempetro, and, uh, and he told me the story of um, the congregation and um, everything that was involved in that and what it caused. And I'm just, I am so grateful to Sam for what he gave um, in term, particularly to, to try to serve um, the under-resourced in our community. And uh, it was, I was deeply encouraged by his faith and his grace um, while we met. So um, thank you so much, Sam. <laughs> Within our diocesan office, um, um, Bonnie Catalano, um, the executive assistant to the bishop, served from November 2002 until her retirement in April of this year. Um, uh, I, I, there are no words. Um, uh, I, I just, I cannot imagine um, uh, all that Bonnie um, sort of navigated in that particular period in the life of this diocese. So I'm very grateful to Bonnie for her service to the diocese. Um, uh, Stephanie Finn has joined uh, our staff as the Interim Director of Communications in June and has been responsible for uh, updating websites and um, um, forcing me to answer questions on video um, <laughs> and um, things like that and has done a fantastic job and asking great questions about, Bishop, what, what do you want to say here? It's like, I'm glad somebody's asking that. That's fantastic. Uh, Christina Silva joined our staff as the Interim Diocese and Executive Assistant in July. Again, she's unfortunately can't not be here because she's not well. And Jen Newhouse joined our staff as part-time administrative assistant in September. So we're really grateful for uh, these folks. So nice to have you among us. Um, on diocesan governance, the following names, um, um, the following people, they're not names, not that they're actual people. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, I'm reading from the script and I realize that's probably not a great use of words there. So the, the following people will complete their terms serving our governing bodies this year. But I want to begin with the standing committee, both um, the Reverend Elaine Storm and uh, Mr. Kirk Botula, who are um, Batula. So that sounds horrible when you think about it, isn't it? Yes. Um, um, sorry, Kirk. So sorry. Um, uh, Uh, I'll, I'll get better at this, I promise. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to say a couple of things. Well, first I want to say something about Elaine, who 
as the president of the standing committee, as I have um, come on board as bishop, has been um, just fantastic, um, unspeakably fantastic, has provided me with um, advice and counsel up, including to just last week when I said, Elaine, what do you think I should do about this? And uh, she has shown wisdom and grace, and, um, and boy, has she worked hard. And so I'm really, really grateful um, um, to Elaine, and I'm going to stand up and clap for you. <laughs> But I also want to say about the Standing Committee in general, um, just the work that they have done um, in the interim as serving as ecclesiastical authority. Um, again, presidents of Standing Committee will have a deeper sense of this, but all of the Standing Committee have put in innumerable hours, have done, often they, they joined, well, many of them joined the committee thinking, do, 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 here we go. Um, and oh, no, that's not what happened. Um, and it was more than they thought. And I think that they have done a fantastic job. And they, have the, the, not just Elaine, but er, they all have served the diocese um, well. It is not easy work. So thank you to all the members of the standing committee who served particularly in the interim um, between bishops. Um, also, and from a diocese of governance sort of moving, Mr. Derek Harrington, um, Winifred Sherman, and Nicole DeLuca um, are going to be leaving the Board of Trustees. Mr. Uh, Derek is, of course, uh, the chair of the board and has served the board in different con contexts um, on and off over many, many years. And uh, all of these people have been, again, served the diocese uh, tirelessly and have brought great wisdom and uh, direction in the matters of just the, the, the financial matters of the, of the, the church. Um, so thank you to the, all these folks. <laughs> and Dan Oliver um, will also be leaving diocese and council. Um, he, he's a representative from, from District 8, so thank you so much to Dan. <laughs> so on some other um, diocesan committees. Uh, the following names will complete their terms serving in other areas of diocesan leadership this year. In the array, um, uh, Reverend John Bailey, the Reverend Eric Rhodes, and Mr. Doug Wicker will be leaving the array um, uh, this, uh, at this convention. And uh, uh, Delia will be leaving the uh, Committee on Canons, but she has a different job. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's all very good. And deputies to extra diocesan synods, um, Bill Stark and Sarah Qualick, uh, finish up their terms at this point. So let's give thanks to them. I want to um, say a prayer of thanksgiving to all people who have served. Um, we all know, um, and if we don't, we, um, you'll know now, that the Christian life is a life of service. It is about giving of ourselves um, for um, the gospel and for our neighbors. And so I am grateful to all who have done this. So Father God, we give you thanks and praise for your faithful people who love you, love Jesus, and Lord, also love your church. Thank you for what they have given. Um, Lord, we, um, we give thanks um, particularly where it has cost them um, and that it has cost in some cases very dearly. Lord, we thank you um, that you have called these people forward and we ask, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would fill them, that you would refresh them, um, that they um, may continue to serve you with joy and peace. We, give this thing, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to go move on to some announcements now because we're kind of waiting for results again. Um, uh, first thing I want to mention to folks, uh, just coming actually, actually this, this week, um, Trinity School for Ministry is having their um, um, mission days this week, and I know a lot of you are already aware of that, but uh, they have various things that are going on, and there are various people from Trinity here that can give you, like Leslie and others, can give you some more details on that. 
But it's, again, it's a, a great opportunity for you to connect with some of the work that Trinity School for Ministry is doing in our neighborhood that is um, advancing the cause of the gospel. Um, I'm doing my very best to be at some of that in some ways, but um, we are closing on a house on Tuesday and um, getting, anyway, um, I'm working on it um, uh, uh, to, to do there. Again, I've already mentioned this, and um, I don't know, um, Sarah, could you just take that, these to the back? These are just sort of the, the, some flyers on that congregational event on renewal and revitalization that's happening uh, January uh, 19th and 20th and with uh, Ken and Mark Eldridge. So um, there's some information on that. Again, I commend that to you because renewal and revitalization uh, will be very important in our life going forward, uh, and that's really important. Um, those were my announcements. Are there any other announcements? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you. All right. Um, you'll want to, um, well, you may not want to, but I uh, commend that you mark your calendars um, for 150th, 58th Convention of the Anglican Diocese of Pittsburgh, and it will be November 3rd to 4th. Um, next year, I anticipate that we may, um, we intentionally at this convention said, let's just keep it simple, um, gather for the morning, um, and send people on for the rest of the day. Um, having had some time to settle in, um, um, I may want to do more next time around. So we may do a Friday night and Saturday and that sort of thing. So just put that in uh, your calendar as we go along. Perfect. All right. Very good. And I'll stop there. There's one more um, announcement, but we'll keep on business. Okay, so, all right, we have to do a third ballot. Alan, please come up. Here are the results of the second Standing Committee clergy ballot. The Reverend Clint Curley received 42.9% of the vote. The Reverend John Bailey received 40.4% of the vote. And the Reverend Canon Tracy Russell received 16.7% of the vote. All right. So what that means on this third ballot, which I believe are... I think the technical word for this is goldenrod um, for the clergy and blue for the lay people. If you could remove the names of uh, Reverend Deacon John Mark Smith and the Reverend Canon Tracy Russell from that list and vote for um, one of the other remaining candidates being Reverend John Bailey and Reverend Clint Curley. Nope. All right. Your life is 10 minutes. Uh, I'll do some. I think we won't do a year in the life. I'll do. I'll think of something. Yeah. Stump the bishop. We could. Why don't we do that? I think we'll do that. All right. Are all? Let me know. Put your hand up if you still have a ballot to cast. All right, um, the tellers are going to uh, do their job, and there are one other announcement, just a reminder, um, if you, your, your name tags, if you could take them out and leave them at the baskets at the door on your way out, that would be helpful because um, you would not believe how expensive name tags actually are. They're just, they, just pieces of plastic. Oh, yeah, well, they cost, um, so if we can recycle them uh, and use them again, that would be fantastic. Um, can we recycle the envelopes? And too? why don't we recycle the envelopes too? If you want to bring the, these in, that would be that would be fantastic. All right. So we're we're we are um, we are finished largely our business, uh, although we have to get a report back from the tellers. So um, I'm going to um, open the floor if for any questions you might have um, for me. 
because I love questions. <laughs> How's my puppy? Oh, how my uh, I'm stressed. Thank you. Um, he's uh, lived in different spaces. Uh, currently, a um, not very large hotel room, and uh, and so um, he was a little fractious going to sleep last night, and love disturbing other people. That's fantastic. So um, so that was fun. Um, but beyond that, um, he's well. We will be very happy to be settled in a home where um, he can um, have the run of the place within reason. So thanks for asking. My puppy is great. Um, Okay, well, he's, there's a, the breed actually has a name, and um, which I think is a stupid name, but I will use it. He's a cockapoo, um, which is kind of a silly name. He's very adorable, but it's a, it's a mix between cocker spaniel and poodle, and so he's non-shedding and hyperallergenic and all that kind of stuff. So whenever people ask me, I tend to say, he's a, a cross between a cocker spaniel and a poodle, so I don't have to say the name, which I think is silly. So... <laughs> But it's an actual breed, and he's registered with the American, you know, kennel club of cockapoos or whatever it's called. So, um, so, you know, put that on your wall. Oh, thank you, Tracy, so much for asking. Um, has Tamara found studio space? Um, Tamara, why don't you stand up and tell them if you found studio space? So um, we, um, for those of you who do not know, my wife um, is a uh, ceramic artist, and so we um, need space in our home for a studio. We are, the first thing we're going to do when we take possession is we're going to, um, this is Tuesday night if people have any time to help us. Um, we're literally, um, don't laugh, I'm, you, know, if you do have time to help me Tuesday night. Um, we're carrying up the carpet in the basement um, to expose a cement floor, because a cement floor um, I mean, glaze does not go well with carpet, so I'm just saying. Pardon me? I, 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 oh, oh, you mean actual vote in the actual election and not just here, yes. That is a great, that's a great exhortation. Um, uh, make sure you vote. I'll tell you a little story. I come from a family of politicians. My father was a politician, my grandfather was a politician, and my great-grandfather was a politician. They all ran for public office. And my father often said, um, to fail to vote um, is to abdicate democracy. Um, and um, he was opinionated about that. And, um, and I lived here for many years um, as, a, as an immigrant in the United States. I was an immigrant from Canada, so it doesn't really feel like a real immigrant. But I was, I was technically, I was technically an immigrant and could not vote. And I became a citizen of the United States because I feel strong, so strongly that it is, it is important and necessary to vote. And I did not want to live any longer in a country where I could not vote. So. <laughs> And as they say in Nova Scotia, vote early, vote often. <laughs> and Chicago, yes, yes. Yeah, so true. Places where you can do that. Um, is there another? Oh. How will I celebrate Thanksgiving? Well, this is Thanksgiving. Uh, so again, you know, I'm Canadian, and there's Canadian Thanksgiving. And I'm kind of a bit of a Canadian bigot, because I think Canada's fantastic, um, although I live here and became a citizen here. But anyway, never mind. Um, the, 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 the whole thing that the big event happens on Thursday, and then, if you're smart enough to avoid stores, um, the rest of the weekend is this clear and open thing. That is. That's just brilliant. Like in Canada, the, the big event day is like Sunday or Monday, and so you're just stressed about it the whole weekend. So this is fantastic. I love Thanksgiving. And my, um, it is one of my favorite days of the year because um, typically we always have people at our house for Thanksgiving, and typically people that we've never met before end up at our table at Thanksgiving. 
Um, I may not get accomplished this year, but you never know. And, uh, but I get up at about five and I start cooking because Thanksgiving and Christmas are my events. And I start, um, I have a, a rhythm. I start with the stuffing, I move on to the pies, then I stuff the turkey and I move on to the vegetables. And it, I love the day. I love the day. It's fantastic. And so um, I will be cooking Thanksgiving dinner uh, for at least tomorrow and I, and we have invited one or two other people to join us. So that will be happening. My family is not coming this Thanksgiving, but most of them are coming at Christmas, so that's fantastic. What kind of pie? What kind of pie? <laughs> so, um, I, I make all kinds of pies, but um, I, 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 I'll be frank with you, um, I make fantastic pastry. Um, um, you know, I, 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 I do, I, uh, people have told me. So um, even my mother, who was a fantastic cook, had admitted that my pastry was bigger, b better than hers, which is the only time she admitted anything like that in her entire life. So um, I think I m might have marked it on a calendar. But um, so um, I love a classic, I don't know how classic this is, but I love an apple and cranberry pie. Um, well, that I do a really nice, um, I know they're real, it's really good. Um, I love, um, I do a mixed berry pie, which I call bumbleberry, which is also really, really good. And I have, I have done punk, pumpkin pie also from scratch. Um, and in my humble opinion, buy a can. Um, it's just as good and way less work. Um, uh, just, 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 that's, that's my opinion. So there we are. So this is taking longer than I thought. So, <laughs> so. Oh, a question, how did we land on Wexford? Well, we landed on Wexford for two reasons, one of which it was the house that had the studio space, mostly, um, because we needed a basement that, that was not, like a lot of people have poured a lot of time and effort and money into refinishing their basements, and it would be just a tragedy to rip all that out to you know, get down to the cement uh, floor. So this house just had carpet on the floor in that section, and that's easy to do something about. So it was really the space. And frankly, our real estate agent, I think, had a prejudice towards the North Hills. Um, I, th I, you know, yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, so. How are we oh, they're coming with the results. Um, is, there, is there another question? Have I figured how to get our own Pittsburgh yet? Um, well, ex I figured this out. Um, if it's 15 miles, it'll take you 45 minutes, um, um, which is new. Um, and uh, I, I was very, I we, were, we were renting a small Airbnb for about a month in October that's, that was um, um, in, in um, Coriopolis. And uh, I forget the day it was, but one day sometime last month, I made it home without GPS. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. All right, we have, it seems, results. Here are the results of the third standing committee clergy ballot. The Reverend Clint Curley received 50.6% of the vote and has been elected as a clergy member to the standing committee. to say, I, I almost was going to withdraw my name. Uh, on the way here, I was thinking about my sister. I've known my brother-in-law, who's been married to my sister, for uh, uh, over 40 years. And he's removed, had a cancer removed, uh, had, excuse me, had a kidney removed from cancer 18 years ago. And now his other kidney has been infected with cancer. And in the last month, I've learned. And so I was wanting to pull out because of wanting to pay more attention to 
my sister's needs in northeastern Ohio once in a while getting there on the weekend. So I'm a little bit relieved, but I want to say I am grateful to those of you uh, who nominated me and voted for me, and I do congratulate Clint. But would you indulge me to pray for my brother-in-law, Jim? Yes, absolutely. Please. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Dawson Convention and for this opportunity. And um, I want to lift up my brother-in-law, Jim, who's been a faithful husband uh, for over 40 years to my sister, Helen. And I pray for her, for their children, for their grandchildren as they go through this difficult time. Uh, she's been in and out of hospital the last month. And I pray, Lord, that um, you would help myself and other siblings be supportive to Helen and Jim in this time. And I pray for Clint and the rest of the standing committee as they work with the bishop um, as we move forward uh, to move beyond hurt into hope, to bring that hope of Jesus Christ to others. And I pray all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Can I say that I've really enjoyed being with you today? I really have. So it's been good. In consideration of the work that we have accomplished, I will entertain a motion that this 157th convention be adjourned. Moved by uh, Jonathan Millard, seconded by Leslie Thyberg. Are there any questions or discussion? I thought not. All right. All in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. All opposed, nay, raise your hand. I declare this 157th convention adjourned. Let us stand to pray. And together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much.